So, hola, and welcome to our, to our workshop um, about running the Beacon Chain Explorer on your own. Um, we will go through how we came to the idea to make the Beacon, Beacon, Beacon Chain Explorer, and then we will explain how we how you can actually run the Beacon Chain Explorer. We, this is Stefan, my colleague, and me, Patrick. We both work for the company Bitfly. So yeah, first we will, uh, Stefan will introduce you to our company and how we actually came to the idea to make an explorer to the, for, the, for the next stage of the Ethereum project. Then we go briefly into the, through the architecture of the project. And finally, we will show how you can run the Explorer on your own. But before we start with anything, everyone who, everyone who wants to participate, like interactively, we need you. Ooh, sorry, I was on the wrong laptop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will go first to um, how we came to do the Beacon Chain Explorer and um, what, what the architecture of the project look, looks like. And finally, we will show you how you run the Explorer. But before we go to anything, we need you, anyone who wants to participate, we need you to, to download a few things. So are there any, anyone who, who wants to participate on his laptop? Um, do we have installed Docker in Docker Compose? Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So can you basically try and see if you can access the repository, if we made it public or not? Yeah, then I'll quickly, we'll jump back to that. And I'll quickly introduce uh, kind of who we are a bit more in detail. So um, the company Bitfly was founded in 2017, and we've done a range of products. Um, the, we've been basically active since the beginning of Ethereum in the space. We actually created uh, one of the first block explorers, but kind of let it slack a bit. So that was etherchain.org. It's one of the older ones. And then later on, we kind of regretted not putting more effort into that explorer. And then we uh, kind of decided now that there's uh, going to be Ethereum 2.0 or ex um, basically the merge, we decided to create another explorer specifically for phase zero. Um, and that explorer uh, kind of ended up being the beacon chain explorer and it started out where everyone uh, could basically see all the information about the beacon chain. Uh, maybe a show of hands who has used the explorer before, maybe just to kind of get a feel. Um, so about half of the people have used the explorer before. Um, so maybe if you want to a show of hands who's running a validator. Uh, okay. Uh, Quite, quite a few of the people that are using it. Um, so basically we, we wanted to create a nice place for you to understand what's actually going on with the validator, uh, to see the different states of the validator to kind of make sure you don't get slashed. Um, and uh, we also operated uh, one of the bigger mining pools called ethermine.org that was now retired um, since the merge and we kind of shifted away from mining a bit and focusing, we're focusing a bit more on staking. So kind of to shill a bit our other products, we have staking.ethermine.org now where you can stake with less than uh, 32 ETH and we have ETH pool. If you're too lazy to run your own validator, you can just upload your validator key and we'll kind of take care of that for you. Uh, um, uh, and then a brief history, I kind of already touched on that. So um, it started out in 2019, end of 2019, with the first test networks. So even before um, the genesis of the beacon chain, here you can see a small or kind of nice picture of the genesis event. Um, we kind of created like a slot view. So um, each one of those rows, if you don't know, um, is an epoch. And in one epoch, there are 32 slots. And here you can kind of see uh, the green part is when it was proposed. The red one is when it's missed. Um, and the yellow is if it's orphaned. Um, and that's kind of a nice overview of the first few epochs uh, when the genesis happened. And we also have like a checklist below uh, how much finalization we have, uh, no, how participation we have, and if the epoch is justified and finalized. Um, and a nice rocket for like the countdown when genesis started, um, which is also pretty, pretty nice. Um, so that's kind of uh, 
how how this whole project began and it kind of exploded a bit more and more and with the merge we uh, tried to add more information not just um, the phase zero information and it kind of grew and grew and this presentation will also be kind of about how we kind of handled the scale and we'll also give a kind of a workshop where you can help us with with kind of finding ways to scale better um, yeah so let's go a bit to the architecture so in the beginning this is kind of uh, a very simple view what uh, the beacon chain explorer looked like i also presented this uh, a similar slide um, i think it was ECC uh, a year ago um, where we had just the prism node we had infura node and the funeral node was mainly to get the deposit data from eth1 um, and then we had an exporter that just basically wrote everything into Postgres database and that worked really well in the beginning. It was really easy uh, to work on. Uh, and then we just had a, a Golang front end with some templates that kind of served everything to the end user. Uh, and even uh, when I presented it back then, we kind of can see that uh, Prism already needed like uh, 576 uh, 67 gigabytes of data, Aragon node already 1.4 terabytes, and Postgres already two terabytes of data. And then I looked at these numbers again, how it's running today, and kind of a reason why we had to scale a bit more. Um, so the numbers now are that we switched to Lighthouse, um, and we have a 32 slot sync. So there's different kind of sync versions that you can choose, and it, depending on what um, amount of slots you choose, the more information is stored, but the quicker you can retrieve information. And we basically want to store everything. And uh, that's already a five terabyte uh, yeah, disk that you need for that lighthouse. Then Aragon is 2.1 and our Postgres database is huge. So uh, kind of the tables and the indexes that we have in the Postgres database, they just don't scale that well. So it's already 10 terabytes big and we don't only run the mainnet, we also run the testnet. Uh, and the test net is just that amount and even a bit more for different test nets. So it's a huge amount of data and it's getting a bit expensive running that in the cloud. So we're gonna talk about how we kind of started migrating away from that. Um, and basically the, the scaling challenges uh, during the merge. So this is kind of a analytics view that we had. So we had um, concurrent sessions of 2,267 uh, people that were looking during the merge because we had like this nice slot view that you saw before where people could see, okay, during the transition, um, what was happening. Uh, it was it's a nice visual way of kind of tracking it. And we had a lot of people, um, we kind of were kind of prepared. So you have this Super Mario mushroom that should power you up, but that mushroom was kind of overpowered by the people looking at it because uh, the way the architecture was designed, it just didn't scale well. We have front end instances that kind of have to query the same stuff. Uh, like if we have five front end instances, they do five times the same queries because we don't just have like one layer that updates our cache. We just have every front end instance that has its own cache. So these are things we kind of try to try to uh, improve. And then again, we have uh, very expensive indexing as well in, in big table and big ta uh, no, no, a big table. That's what we're going to get to later in Postgres. Um, and Postgres also has to get a lot of the table into memory to be able to query stuff, um, which is uh, a lot of the times not very efficient, especially with huge amount of data. Um, and um, so what we try to do is uh, we have we started out with one big binary uh, where everything runs and we try to strip away things from that big binary and kind of isolate that in microservices that uh, not every binary does everything and if we duplicate one binary we don't do uh, unnecessary work um, and kind of the migration is kind of a bit challenging for us because then we have to kind of make sure that we manage a lot of the technical depth that we uh, kind of have and are maybe adding through changing technologies. Yeah. Could someone maybe say if they can access the repository? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, there's a Docker file in the Docker Compose file in it. And if you just run Docker, com, uh, Docker Compose pull, it will pull all the images. And when we later get to the interactive part, everything will be done. Uh, we have all the things ready. Sorry. Okay, great. I hope the internet is good. Uh, let's pray a bit because uh, when we tried it or tested it before, uh, it took a while. So um, here you can see I 
kind of touched on that, um, the scaling and large tables. So in Postgres, in the beginning, we didn't have any partitioning uh, at all. So later on, when you can just maybe hold, I'll, I can hold it up. There and you go. can maybe go. Okay. <laughs> um, again, lots of assumptions that we made without knowing too much of the spec or, or your uh, specific yeah. use case, but let's go. So cloud first, I think still makes sense, especially for like yeah. DOS or whatever you guys might need that for. Um, in terms of front end, I don't know if this is a bottleneck, but we mentioned it, uh, thought about clustering or some auto scale for this, or even if we're going to go like, to the Web3 ethos of, let's put this on IPFS or like distribute it somehow um, and really make it un, un, undeniable service uh, net scaling that way, or it could be just some some auto scaling service in Cloud Run or GCP or whatever we might use for that. So I don't think this would be the bottleneck anyways, the front end itself, yeah. I think that, and if, if depending on what you have here, this could be heavily um, statically generated, so it might be something that you wouldn't be a problem. Then uh, second layer, we're talking about the cache. So I imagine most people are, our team imagines that most people are looking at past data. So mm -hmm. you probably don't have to have uh, direct access to the database. You don't have yeah. to do like real queries against it. You probably could cache heavily um, previous data that was already um, from previous blocks that will yeah. never change. So things that could be like pretty, pretty much frozen there because it's not, it's, it's really static and, 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 and stale data, let's call it that. Um, so this, depending, I, I guess there are probably lots of ways of doing this cache layer. This could be like a, a DB level. This could be some like Redis cache level or something like that. But yeah, really, really something before the database itself. Then on database, um, our friend, I forgot his name, but our friend there gave an idea of maybe we could start sharding this. Maybe yeah. some sharding based on transaction hash or something like that, which um, same thing, uh, since this is mostly data that will live forever and not yeah. touch it again, we probably have a part that's only read only. So it's there, um, very high output for reads, uh, not that much in terms of uh, writes and a part which will be the right part, which this part here would have uh, more direct access to the actual nodes. And then the nodes um, probably makes sense to have multiple archive nodes. If, if the RPC calls might be a problem, I don't know if it okay. makes sense to have like, lots of different machines running those uh, instead of Infura. And fear for us in our company is always a problem. And fear not me, or if yeah. there's anyone from these companies, talk to me, please. <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe just run your own archive notes for yeah. these. Not sure also if the, the actual RPC calls are a, a no, bottleneck for you guys. Not, no, it's good to have a backup. Okay, so yeah. at least, yeah, maybe to like archive notes yeah. you guys are gonna run for that. Um, and then this part here would just be like the heavy write part, yeah. which everything that you check as a new, you would just update the database based Perfect. on that. Thanks so, so much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> participating. <in it. laughs> I'm going to hang that up. <laughs> okay. Let's start over. So, um, this is the solution we came up with. <clears throat> so, we, we switch Kind of the solution we have right now. <laughs> yeah, this is the solution we have right now. Uh, kind of. uh, we switch. We, Parts of the of the of the of the data set we now store in big table instead of in, po in Postgres. So we thought like it's not really necessary to have a relational database for this kind of data set, and big table scales really well. So I think like, we we were able to to index the, all of the current uh, eat one transactions uh, in five hours. So it's like really it scales really well big table. So we now store the blocks, the balances of the validators, every transaction, <coughs> all of the attestations in Bigtable. Um, and this resulted in a really much more stable um, ex uh, in index time. So now you can see it takes us like really stable 30 seconds to export all the data of one epoch. <clears throat> yeah, and this is where we come to the interactive part of this of this workshop. Um, for everyone who wants to participate, so he's just resetting everything he's done to kind of start fresh with you guys. <laughs> So the first thing we, we, we want to do is to initialize the, the databases. So we turn on Postgres, Redis, and Bigtable, and initialize the, the, the Postgres tables and the Bigtable, uh, big uh, what is it called, tables? 
Na, ty to bez. So. The next thing we want to do is to start the it one indexer. We called it that because um, we are not really creative, <laughs> but it indexes like it in, it, it, it first um, gets the blocks from the execution client um, and uh, encodes it in, in protobuf and stores it in, into pick table encoded in protobuf, and then. We index as a, after that we index the the blocks with all the the fields and values and the transaction as well. So, oh one one big thing is like we're actually not using Bigtable from from Google Cloud. We are using uh, Bigtable emulate, em, emulator from the company Bitly. It just emulates the, the peak table API and stores it in SQLite database. And I think like for for just storing and then analyzing the data, it works well. It's not like it will not scale for uh, for a thousand requests per second, but for analyzing the data, it's a, like a really good solution, solution in our opinion. So the the thing here is, we are not able to to reach the nodes we 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 synced before the the workshop in the cloud. Somehow we don't get access via this Wi-Fi. So we are now running the nodes on our laptops, and that is where you see some errors because the nodes are not synced and it the, it's not like doesn't work well. But get the app here. So now we have the databases and the it one index running. The next thing we want to run is the the exporter. The exporter is like just uh, the exporter we had before the merge, but now it will index the the blocks from the from the from the big table that we just exported in the in the it one indexer. Again, we have some errors because the nodes are not synced. The next thing is like the the the, the statistics module module. And this is also a really important uh, and integral part of the whole project because the indexer will aggregate the data of, of one day and store the aggregated data of the one of of, of one beacon chain day in the database, and so it all the queries become much faster. And the last thing we start is the front end. It will get started with the with the cache updater and the, the front end itself, which is a, a Golang web server, which just queries all the databases. So all the things are running now. And we can browse the Beacon Gen Explorer on localhost 8080. The thing is, since the nodes are not synced, um, it will take some time until any data will show up. Um, this one. There's some extra extra um, scripts we we wrote in, into the into the into the into the, into the, into the main script. Um, the thing is, like we 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 understand like this repository not as we want to 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 make it the the, the big chain explorer available for everyone who wants to to explore the big big chain. Not so you don't have to trust us by going to big chain.org, uh, big big chain, 
Pikinche.in, you can run it yourself. It will take some time until it's like synced, and we will we will try to make it more easy. But the thing is, we really um, what is it saying? We stand by the decision to make this a grow open source. So it's not we will we will try to 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 make it available for everyone. It's not like we made the decision to go into Bigtable from 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 Google and to run it in GCP. Just to, to make the scaling issue like gone, but that doesn't mean it's it's not available for everyone. Thanks to such amazing open source project like from Bit, Bitly, the uh, GCP emulator. So the last script is now you have like a Postgres database where you can tinker with the data. We made just some. The script is not up to date. <laughs> but now it is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. The services. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I want to do that. But has anyone followed along? Don't Is anyone following along? Is it working? Or? You, you, okay, it's working. You yeah. Try the uh, explore block command as well. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, so, so the thing is like with this with this uh, repository. We show really how you can set up the, the explorer. And we we know it's not like there's a lot of technical depth, technical depth that is like we need to solve it, but it, it's working for everyone, not just for those who have really GCP accounts and everything. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Yes. Das ist schon ja, das ist probably, ja. Soll ich das machen? Ja, machen. Okay, so for anyone using um, our mobile app or the website, we've got a um, discount code Bogota50. If you want to use it, you can get our um, premium app um, services. Uh, if you have a lot of validators, it's nice, uh, among other things. Or if you want to use our API services, um, you can use the code over the website, not directly over the mobile. Um, and yeah, uh, if you're running a validator of the mobile and you don't know about the mobile app, it's pretty nice. Uh, it lets you look at your validators on the go. It lets you get notifications when you propose a block um, and kind of see if you've gotten uh, those 30 ETH block reward or something like that. Um, yeah. Okay, then. Uh, Hmm? Is there a lot of features? Oh. Yeah. Um, if you want to contribute, um, here's kind of the overview um, of kind of the resources. So um, we have a Gitcoin grant that's linked below. Uh, you can tweet at Beacon Chain uh, if you see any issues or something. Create issues uh, on the GitHub repository that's also linked there. Um, and oh, did anyone still want to take a picture? Hmm. Or no, thanks. Yeah, that's basically it from us. Thanks so much for participating and listening. If you have any questions, um, yours right now that you, uh, Sepolia it's called, so it's one of the test nets, it's a bit smaller. So it should be able to sync in a reasonable about, of, amount of time. Um, the Wi-Fi isn't the best here, so here it could take a while, um, but it's a lot smaller than Prata, or which is girly, or Mainnet, uh, which uh, are pretty huge right now. Okay. Any other questions? Um, uh, not sure if I <laughs> if I should answer that.
but um, it's it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot. So it's um, what is it? Five figures. Yeah. We we looked especially at SillaDB. Patrick. We looked at SillaDB especially, but we looked also at, at other DBs. But in the end, we took something that also fits in our team. Like we don't have so much resources. I was like so much, take so much man hours to get into a new technology. And for us, this looked like the best fit. And right now we are really happy with it, so. Yeah, we basically went from an export time of uh, 30 plus seconds for attestation assignments to like five seconds, which is a lot better. And there was less contention uh, between different queries uh, on Big Table now that we move, but that can change if we have everything on Big Table. We're just starting to migrate. So I hope it stays good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and layer two is coming. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anything else? Thank you very much for listening and for participating again. Yes, thank you so much.